I am Dr. Jason Johnson, one of the Pediatric Cardiology Fellows at Duke University, and this is the Voice Annotated PowerPoint on Endocarditis in the Pediatric Population. This presentation will go over the definition of endocarditis. I will discuss the incidence of endocarditis and the pathophysiology, including the clinical features. I will also discuss how the diagnosis of endocarditis is made and the management of these patients. As I mentioned on the title slide, this presentation will focus primarily on endocarditis in pediatric patients, but there will be some basic overlap with endocarditis defined in the adult population. The definition of endocarditis is an infection or inflammation of the endocardium. This can be further delineated to either the endocardial surface or endocardial structures, like the heart valves. The valves of the heart are histologically different from other heart tissues. The incidence of endocarditis is reported at 1 in 1,200 to 4,500 pediatric admissions. The mean age of pediatric patients with endocarditis continues to rise and is currently at 13 years of age. This is most likely due to the longer survival of patients with congenital heart disease. However, endocarditis rates in neonates continue to rise. This is more than likely related to instrumentation of these neonates with indwelling lines. Interestingly enough, a bacteremic state is only present in one-third of the cases. The development of endocarditis requires several steps. The first stage is typically turbulence or trauma to the endothelial surface of the heart. This can occur for any reason. The second stage requires a transient bacteremia that leads to seeding of these previously created lesions with adherent bacteria. This ultimately leads to local tissue destruction. This can be defined as erosions on leaflets or cordae that can cause valvular insufficiency and ultimately lead to heart failure. Abscesses can erode into conduction system causing heart block, these abscesses can also weaken vascular walls, leading to aneurysmal formations that have the tendency to rupture. Very large vegetations or growths of bacteria can cause obstruction to blood flow. Embolic phenomena are a real concern of endocarditis. The lungs are the most common site of emboli due to a majority of endocarditis affecting the right-sided heart structures. When a vegetation is present, on the systemic, or left ventricular side, the kidney is the most common, followed by the spleen and then the brain. Although the brain is only the third most common site of systemic embolization, cerebral emboli have been found in up to 30% of cases of endocarditis. One should note that the aortic valve vegetations have the highest chance of embolization. These are gross specimens of aortic valve endocarditis. The picture on the top left is a close-up of the aortic valve transected along one of the commissures. You can identify it as aortic valve due to the presence of the coronary artery ostium present just distal to the semilunar valves. The arrow is pointing to the vegetation attached to the ventricular side of the aortic valve. The picture on the top right again shows a vegetation on the ventricular side of the semilunar valve as shown by the black arrow. The pictures on the top are less severe. The picture on the bottom left shows a large vegetation of the aortic valve with complete deterioration of one of the cusps and growth into the left ventricular cavity. The picture on the bottom right shows extensive vegetations along all three cusps of the aortic valve as shown by the black arrows. The pictures on the bottom are more severe cases with heavy burden of vegetations to the cusps. Knowing the most common organism to cause endocarditis is extremely important. Viridans streptococci, or alpha hemolytic streptococci, and Staphylococcus aureus are the leading causative agents. Being more specific, staphylococcal infections are more common with no underlying heart disease. There is no relationship between organisms and the type of congenital heart disease or the age of the patient. Pseudomonas aeruginosa or serratia marsins are more frequently in IV drug users. Haychick organisms 
or H-A-C-E-K, which stands for Haemophilus actinobacillus cardiobacterium Echinella and Kingella are common in patients with congenital heart disease. They can be very difficult to grow from blood cultures and often require multiple sets. Knowing these common types of endocarditis causing bacteria is important. However, multiple other organisms have been documented to cause infective endocarditis, so keep all organisms in mind for causing infective endocarditis. The clinical presentation of endocarditis is highly variable. The presentation can vary from a fulminant course where patients present in shock or sepsis, or the presentation can be an indolent course with only vague constitutional symptoms that occur over months. The most common sign is fever. However, fever can be absent in up to 10% of cases. When a fever is present, it is typically low-grade and without a specific pattern. Interestingly enough, Murmurs have been documented in 90% of cases. However, most of these murmurs are due to the underlying congenital heart disease. Only 25% of murmurs have been documented as new or changed. Patients can develop heart failure due to acute onset of valve insufficiency in up to 30% of cases. These patients will present with typical heart failure symptoms of dyspnea on exertion, shortness of breath, lower extremity swelling, tachypnea, and failure to thrive. Neurologic involvement can occur in 20% of endocarditis cases. These patients may even have clinical signs of cerebral infarcts. Splenomegaly is a common finding at 50% of endocarditis cases. The spleen is usually non-tender unless it has an infarct or abscess. Petechiae is actually present in up to 50% of cases. The common locations are the mouth, conjunctiva, or extremities. The classic exam findings of Osler nodes, Roth spots, and Janeway lesions are only present in 7% of cases. This slide shows images of the clinical features discussed in the previous slide. The image on the top left is an example of a splinter hemorrhage. Splinter hemorrhages occur due to clots that damage the capillaries under the nail blade. The image on the top right is an example of a Janeway lesion, which are non-tender, small, erythematous, or nodular lesions on the palms or soles, only a few millimeters in diameter. Pathologically, the lesion is described to be a microabscess from septic emboli of the dermis with marked necrosis and inflammatory infiltrate not involving the epidermis. The image on the bottom left is an example of an Osler node, which are tender papulopustules located on the pulp of the finger. The image on the bottom right is an example of subconjunctival petechiae. The diagnosis of endocarditis is made by following the modified Duke criteria. This slide will go over the definition of the specific criteria. The next slide will go over the actual diagnosis using these terms. The first major criteria is a positive blood culture from typical organisms from infective endocarditis. The typical microorganisms consistent with infective endocarditis should come from two separate blood cultures and include Viridan streptococci, Streptococcus bovis, Haycheck group, Staphylococcus aureus, or community-acquired enterococci in the absence of a primary focus. The second major criteria is a positive echocardiogram for infective endocarditis. A positive echocardiogram is defined as an oscillating intracardiac mass on valve or supporting structures or on implanted material in the absence of an alternative anatomic explanation. The other positive findings include an abscess or new partial dehiscence of prosthetic valve or new valvular regurgitation. The minor criteria are a predisposing heart condition, like congenital heart disease, or IV drug use, fever of at least 38 degrees Celsius, vascular phenomenon defined as a major arterial emboli, septic pulmonary infarcts, mycotic aneurysm, intracranial hemorrhage, conjunctival hemorrhage, Janeway lesions, immunologic phenomenon defined as glomerulonephritis, Osler's nodes, Roth spots, rheumatoid factor, and finally, 
microbiologic evidence with a positive blood culture not meeting major criteria or serologic evidence of active infection with organism consistent with infective endocarditis. Using the definitions from the previous slide, definite infective endocarditis defined by pathologic criteria, which is a microorganism demonstrated by culture or histology in a vegetation or in a vegetation that has embolized or in an intracardiac abscess, or pathologic lesions defined as a vegetation or intracardiac abscess confirmed by histology showing active endocarditis. However, histological diagnosis of the vegetation may not always be warranted or available. Therefore, the clinical criteria involve the major and minor criteria discussed previously. Using specific definitions listed in the previous slide, definitive endocarditis is defined by two major criteria, or one major and three minor criteria, or five minor criteria. Possible infective endocarditis is defined by one major criteria and one minor criteria, or three minor criteria. The treatment of infective endocarditis utilizes antibiotics and sometimes surgical removal. Antibiotic therapy is tailored to the organism if the culture is available or the type of valve that is infected. When a native valve is infected, ampicillin, sulbactam with gentamicin, or vancomycin with gentamicin is used. When prosthetic valves are infected, vancomycin with gentamicin with rifampin is used. The surgical indications include heart failure, acute aortic or mitral valve regurgitation or obstruction, uncontrolled infection, any abscess, fistula, or enlarging vegetation, persisting fever and positive blood cultures greater than seven days, prevention of an embolism and aortic or mitral valve vegetation greater than 10 millimeters with an embolic episode. We will end by discussing the issues of antibiotic prophylaxis to prevent infective endocarditis. The American Heart Association changed their guidelines for prophylaxis in 2007. The new recommendations limit prophylaxis to a subset of higher risk patients. These patient groups are listed here and include patients with prosthetic valve replacement, patients with previous infective endocarditis, and patients with congenital heart disease. Not all forms of congenital heart disease deserve prophylaxis. The forms that do include cyanotic congenital heart disease without surgical repair, with residual defects, or palliative shunts. Congenital heart disease with complete surgical or catheter repair up to six months after the procedure, and residual defect that persists at a site next to prosthetic material. The treatment during times of risk should be with amoxicillin, or clindamycin in penicillin allergic patients. These are the references to a book chapter, the modified Duke criteria, and the task force on infective endocarditis. Thank you for your time.